Mr. Spengelman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I'd like to welcome Minister Goodale to the committee with his team and extend my congratulations to Mr. Rigby and welcome him in his new role. Um, I'd like to also echo Mr. Matsa's appreciation for bringing this bill to us before second reading. Uh, Minister Goodale, my question falls squarely into the overarching framework that we need both good security and protect our charter rights. And it's about uh, Canadian youth and their vulnerability to uh, terrorism. In particular, we have terrorist networks around the world, like Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines, um, Al Shabaab in Somalia, ISIS in Syria and Levant, and future terrorist networks potentially or likely that will prey on youth in various countries. Um, children, really, people, in, according to my reading, who um, range between age 14 and 19 or into the early 20s. Um, Section 159 of the bill brings the Youth Criminal Justice Act uh, into connection with uh, C-59, applies it to C-59, including the uh, principle that detention is not uh, a substitute for social measures and also that uh, preventative detention uh, as provided for in Section 83.3 uh, of the Criminal Code. Um, falls into that same framework that it's not a substitute. I wonder if you could comment on your vision um, for how the bill relates to young offenders, youth, vulnerable youth, essentially also pre-commission uh, pre of any terrorist offenses or recruitment by networks. Uh, and then also your broader vision about how we can do better in terms of preventing terrorism in the first place uh, by making sure that these networks do not prey on Canadian youth and children. Uh, it's a it's a very serious issue, Mr. Spingerman, um, and you really have touched on the two elements uh, that we're we're working on. One, um, through the collection of new um, provisions that are that are here in Bill C-59, uh, we will give uh, CSIS and the RCMP uh, and our other agencies uh, the. Uh, the ability and the tools uh, to be as well informed uh, as humanly possible about uh, these activities uh, and to be able to function with clarity within the law, within the Constitution, to do what they need to do to counter those threats. Uh, and specifically where offenses arise in relation to young people, the Criminal Youth Justice Act applies. So that is the process by which young offenders will be managed under this law. Uh, the, the other side of it uh, is, is uh, prevention. Uh, and uh, all of the countries in the G20 uh, and probably many others around the world are uh, are turning their attention more and more to this question. I know it's been discussed among the Five Eyes allies. It's been discussed among the G7 uh, countries as well as G20. Uh, how can we find the ways and and share our expertise internationally uh, among all countries that share this concern? How can we find the ways? to identify vulnerable people early enough that you have a decent opportunity to intervene uh, in that spiral downward uh, of, of, uh, of terrorist influence, intervene effectively to, uh, to get them out of that pattern. Um, obviously, uh, intervention and, uh, and, ca and counter radicalization techniques uh, will not work in every circumstance. That's why you need a broad range of tools uh, to, uh, to deal with, uh, uh, with terrorist threats. Uh, but where prevention is possible, we need to develop the expertise to actually do it. Uh, and that is the reason why we created the, uh, the, the new Canada Centre for Community Engagement and, and Prevention of Violence, so that we would have a national office that could coordinate the activities that are going along at the at the at the local and municipal and academic levels across the country. Coordinate all of that. Put some more resources behind that. Make sure that we're sharing the very best ideas and information, so that if we can prevent a tragedy, we've actually got the tools to do it. Mr. Thank you. Very briefly, would it be fair to say that disrupting recruitment recruitment efforts of international or domestic terrorist organizations is as significant as disrupting terrorist finance? Yes, yep. it, it's it's all important. It's hard to it's hard to put them in an order of hier hierarchy, but uh, it's it's all important activity. Thank uh, you. It, Thank and you and it has to be a a, a co coordinated 
full uh, effort with everybody on, on board. Thank you, uh, Mr. Spengelman. Um, I think Mr. Spengelman is uh, leading off uh, for seven minutes, please. Mr. Chair, thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you for remaining with us for the second hour. Um, my first set of questions is about the uh, Secure Air Travel Act. Um, many colleagues, myself included, will have heard from constituents uh, concerns about this, uh, not the legislation, but the current circumstances under which uh, particularly young people and children find themselves uh, flagged by not being on, but flagged by a no-fly list. Uh, and it's difficult to, um, uh, to get around it because we don't have a redress system. I wanted to ask you for your views, um, particularly in light of the minister's comments that this bill was introduced before second reading, uh, for your views on the legislation as it stands in developing a redress system. Uh, are there particular areas that we can pay attention to as a committee? Uh, we are being pushed hard also on the question of timeliness of having this uh, this part of the legislation completed. Um, some constituents feel that there is room for a interim quick fix. Um, I'd like to have your views on whether that's possible and feasible. Uh, but also, uh, once we have the legislation in place and the budget appropriation that's required to fix this problem, uh, what would have to be done operationally to actually build the system? Because I think there's still some misperceptions uh, just of the magnitude, um, the complexity that's involved in building an effective redress system. Um, just as a matter of procedure, can I just ask colleagues to, we have quite an array of witnesses, if they could direct their questions um, to specific perhaps, individuals. Perhaps Mr. Rigby to lead off, but if there are other colleagues who want to come in, I'd welcome that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for the question. I'll, I'll pass it on to, to Monique, who's actually been working on this file to provide some of the details, but, but absolutely, I think uh, the Minister's made it clear that um, establishing a redress system um, is, is a priority for the government. I think within the legislation, we've already started down that track. In terms of a quick fix, I don't think that um, there's necessarily one that is readily available. Uh, as you say, over time, we are going to look at um, a more comprehensive solution in terms of redress. I think it's um, starting off with a centralized screening system so that the government actually does the screening right now. That is the responsibility of the airline. So we'll bring it back um, to the government so that we can actually provide more rigorous and consistent screening across the board. Uh, in the legislation itself, there are also references to the notion of an, identifica an identification number that will allow um, those who request that identification number to be uh, screened ahead of time and if there's any misunderstanding with respect to being on the list, that can be addressed before they actually show up at the airport. Um, we've also made it clear that um, in cases where a child, for example, is not on the, um, the list, uh, we will actually, the government will actually um, inform the parents of that. And that is an important provision we feel in that there's a great deal of apprehension when there is a, a false positive match from parents that, okay, my child is, on, is, is my child on the list, um, uh, whether it's through accident or through some other provision, I think it, it, it uh, removes a lot of that apprehension if we can actually say to a parent, no, the child is not on the list. Um, uh, but over time, yeah, this is going to be um, a very uh, comprehensive um, approach. I think that we will uh, really have to, by, by having the centralized screening process, um, we are actually going to have to build the system up from the ground. So it will require a big IT fix, information technology fix, that will require um, significant funding over time to make that, uh, to make that happen. Uh, but we feel that the legislation is definitely moving us in the right, in the right direction. Monique, did you want to add anything? Um, the only thing I'd add is that um, uh, instituting a redress uh, program is quite complex. It requires legislative amendments, regulatory work, um, consultations with airlines, and uh, some fairly significant IT fixes. And I think in Bill C-59, what do you have are the, um, really the essential first steps that lead us down the path of a centralized um, program. We have uh, the proposed amendments here that will enable public safety to gather the information and to um, establish a program. So 
these are really the, the first steps that we need down the path to okay. a redress uh, program. Is it, is it your testimony then that there, you would not recommend any additional areas of examination within the bill, that the bill really uh, captures what's needed to build the system? I would say we're always open to creative um, suggestions. Um, I think we always believe that we've thought of everything, but we, we welcome new uh, suggestions okay. down that, especially in terms of uh, working with airlines and IT fixes. Okay. I would absolutely concur with that. We're open to any suggestions, of course. Again, we, we do feel that is moving in the right direction, but we would we'd welcome any suggestions from the committee. Are you, are you able to comment how we ended up here. I mean, we have a lot of constituents who travel to the U.S. and they're saying, you know, as, as stigmatizing as it may be to have a redress number, that system seems to be working. Uh, why are we in the current situation? really say why we're in the current situation. Uh, we are working with the U.S. We have established a Canada-U.S. redress working group to also facilitate uh, the, um, the, the troubles that some air passengers may experience, and uh, we are looking to the American experience in establishing their redress program and, and learning lessons from the way that they have done it. Okay. Um, I may ask you to venture outside of the box here, but would you would you have a rough estimate of how long it would take to build the IT parameters that you've described once we have budgetary approval and C-59 enacted? Sorry. Um, we are in very extensive uh, consultations within government interdepartmentally on exactly this issue right now in terms of the actual dollar figure, how long it's going to take. I wouldn't be in a position right now to give you a, a firm estimate on either count. Even, even a loose estimate would be premature? It would be premature at this okay. point. And very briefly, in the remaining 20 seconds, how many departments and agencies would be involved in constructing this redress system? Um, there would be a number of other departments that we are working very closely with. Obviously, CBSA would be one of them, one of the agencies within our portfolio, um, Transport Canada, uh, uh, Shared Services. Uh, so those are only three or four, but there are others as well that we will be consulting, Treasury Board, et cetera. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Thank you.